go figure. All right, so today uh, we will be talking about uh, modules, CSP and WASM source module um, with, uh, and Guy is here to give us an update on, uh, from the modules uh, call that happened yesterday. Go ahead. Sure, um, I'm going to share my screen and I don't have a presentation or anything, but I can at least work through an example that helps to illustrate some of the stuff that I've been kind of like trying to work out around this. Mainly the question is that we've thrown around in discussions or for uh, both JS source modules and WebAssembly source modules, which are already running on the web today. You know, this idea that this can integrate into CSP checks at various levels and we need to I guess, um, as we've been talking about this um, and, and thinking about it from a security perspective, we need to, I guess, try and try to uh, refine what we mean by that and, and what security properties are in play. And so the hope is to try and flesh out some of that. And we do have this example today with WebAssembly where a WebAssembly.module object is a, a structured clonable module object that represents um, a source, a WebAssembly source that can be uh, transferred and executed in these other environments. And as we've been talking about JS modules as well, through the import reflection proposal, where it has this origin information, we've been thinking about if that origin is tied to the source where you get the module from so you you know they've got some kind of secure process that gives you this module you're thinking of the import system as a, as a as a capability resource provider for the compiled module and once you've got it that module represents the capability to execute that module and when you transfer it you're transferring the capability to execute that module and and WebAssembly already does all of this except it doesn't support any content security policy apart from just the global policy which is you can either evaluate WebAssembly or you can't and as we think about more fine-grained content security policies the question comes up can you uh, only permit certain origins and only only certain um, whitelisted uh, modules that that are able to be executed and then how does that interact with the transfer process? Because you can potentially have an iframe with a different content security policy than the mainframe. And if you're passing this thing around, how do those checks get integrated? So the first question was, well, what does WebAssembly do? And then the second question is like, how, how can we integrate this into the work that we're doing on JS source, which is very much falls under the realm of the um, compartments work? Uh, and, and questions around that. And at least for what we're doing with import reflection right now, the question is, are we going to put some kind of stamp on this module that you get back that, that we need to now do for WebAssembly uh, and, and figure that story out? Um, that's the question I've been grappling with and I can dive into a bit here. And as far as I'm aware, that's that's on topic for the discussions we're having here around modules. Um, if, if anyone wants to, um, share any thoughts on that. Um, but that that's kind of the direction that I've taken in trying to research this. Um, uh, Mark, I know you had particular questions about modules that you wanted to discuss. Um, I hope this is something that's clarifying as, as we work it through. And I think it'll be a useful thing to work through. Um, yeah. Uh, so I can, I can get into the example. Sure. Is everyone here sufficiently familiar with content security policy? Um, I don't know that I would ever say I'm sufficiently familiar with it, but I'm, I'm familiar enough with it to know what the topic is. I echo that. Okay, I just posted a simple example into the chat and I'll, I'll just run it through now um, to show how the policy can can work well basically what what happens could right you, now yeah uh, could you use a larger font 
um, or you know, shrink your window or something. Uh, I noticed that as projected, it was, it's okay. That's wonderful. Thank you. Right. So in this example, I'm defining a content security policy for the main page that is allowing scripts to be executed um, self as in from the same origin as this page itself. So I don't want to allow any other domains to execute code. And I'm also adding the WASM and safe eval, which as soon as you turn on content security policy, you're not allowed to execute WASM at all unless you add WASM and safe eval. And that's the only way to execute WASM today. And then I've got a normal uh, module. Uh, with, with, with regard to the WASM semantics of WASM and safe eval? Yes. Um, we've talked about two levels of throttling. Um, uh, with re um, I think the two levels already appear in WASM, even without the um, the WASM JS integra integration. There is the That's turning right. turning uh, text into a WASM module, and there's instantiating a WASM module. Which yes. one does wa does the WASM CSP controls throttle, or both? In in theory, both. I did actually. We did actually discover yesterday that we misread the spec on first reading, and that while there are two checks, they both apply to the compilation phase because there is an overload of the instantiation function, which can also do compilation. And it was only on that overload that it was doing the check. So both checks are still only compilation checks, and therefore there's only one check, which is a compilation check right now. But potentially, we might still need two checks as we discuss some of these fine grained things. Uh, that's what okay. Yeah. Okay. It's very interesting. Sure. Uh, so then I'm loading a module uh, and I will be able to load this module because it's on the same domain and it's going to pass the script source self. If it was in any, any other domain, the content security policy wouldn't allow it. And then I've got an iframe and I'm enforcing the content security policy on that iframe to be that um, it can execute scripts, but only on the same uh, domain again. Um, so the main module in this example, uh, well, first, first one I want to show is that like um, you can uh, you can't execute uh, things on other domains. So uh, if if I if I try and import uh, content from another domain. I'll get a, a CSP error um, because it, it violates the um, CSP policy. Um, and so our imports are also restricted to only those URLs that are permitted by the content security policy. There is one exception to that, and that's if I use a nonce and I put a, a nonce, uh, if I use a nonce policy, which is to, to define a nonce, you're supposed to define it on every single page load and then put that nonce on the, on the top level script. And when I'm using a nonce policy, I can actually get away with importing anything. So then it'll work. Uh, just, to, just to make sure I'm, on, I'm following, the theory there is that the nonce is unguessable and therefore knowledge of the nonce is proof of legitimate authority. Is that the theory? Exactly. The problem with the nonce is that once, once it's done, any module in the graph is allowed to load anything else. So you don't get the checks down the module graph. Whereas normally you would get the checks down for each module in the module graph. So nonce so of the dependency checking. I didn't realize nonce was transitive like that. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, so in a sense, nonce is a more dangerous policy for that reason, because it only takes one hidden dependency to in, embed a little external URL. And before you know it, you've externalized everything. Um, Are the people concerned with browser security uh, concerned about the fact that um, uh, from their perspective, there is no confidentiality within an agent because of Meltdown Inspector? I think um, so. You're supposed to declare it, like here. This is declared in the 
in, in, in meta, but it can come as a header. And the idea is that like it's used right away. So while you're parsing the page, it will be oh. used in the page. Uh, so there is no opportunity really for anything else to go and grab and try to use that nonce uh, another time anyway. And once the nonce has been used, it's, uh, it's, it's burned. Okay. Once the nonce has been used, it's burned. You're yes. supposed to create a new uh, one for every single request. Oh, 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 okay, got it. Sure. So that that was a bit of a diversion, but just to show that we get this transitive property of checking, and so in theory, if you're importing WebAssembly in the module system, that can also be verified against your content security policy, and if you're importing a module as a reflected source that can also be integrated into the content security policy so that verifies that property um, which is nice to have fully um, ensured so then the, the the concern was well how does wasm deal with this problem of if you can transfer WebAssembly modules with structured clone and you have a frame how is um wasm going to deal with the situation where there's two content security policies so in this case I'm allowing WebAssembly eval on the mainframe, um, but on the subframe, I don't have WebAssembly evaluation enabled. So I'm basically have a policy that says WebAssembly is not allowed to evaluate inside the frame. So what if I take a WebAssembly module on the outer frame and then post it into the frame? And um, that, that's got a different security policy where this is the compiled module, will it allow me to execute it? So um, basically the, the instantiation is uh, you fetch the module and you can see this is exactly why we want import reflection. You fetch the module, you run it through compile streaming, and then you have to call instantiate on it. And if we have import reflection, all of the, this will become uh, basically Right, so that the top two lines with import reflection would replace all of, well, without the logs, obviously, would replace these three lines. Uh, so you, you basically replace these two lines with this line in import reflection. Okay, but 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 the the attack would be if line nine mm -hmm. were within the frame, within the subframe exactly. rather than the parent. Okay. Right, so that yeah, that's the example that we've got. So we, we first can compile it and we can instantiate it and we can do that on the mainframe and that's absolutely fine. Um, if I'm in the module frame, uh, so here's the frame, I try and fetch a WebAssembly module, I try to compile it and it's gonna throw an error. Um, So it's not going to let me compile, refuse to compile because it doesn't fulfill this content security policy in the frame, but in the in the parent, I'm able to compile and instantiate. So yeah, th then then the case is now I'm going to um, wait a while for the frame to initialize and then post the module through structured clone to the frame. In the frame, I'm going to pick up that module in a um, uh, event listener, and I'm then going to instantiate that transferred module, and um, it lets me do it. So I'm now able to execute unsafe WASM eval inside of the frame that had a policy that wasn't allowing um, WebAssembly. So yeah, the, our, our questions did, did kind of figure out that, but so that that's that's a good overview of like the situation. And then I guess the question is, should we seek to improve this behavior? Should we, uh, when we think about JavaScript and the transferability, one of the major features of module expressions is allowing you to transfer Java, compiled JavaScript modules. Um, do we, would we expect the same thing to happen or would we want to have stronger guarantees? Um, yeah, that, that's, that's a good. To start the I think the I think the important uh, invariant is that, however we however we end up treating 
WASM modules, we should be treating JavaScript modules the same way. Okay, that's a good start. And um, I am following up this question with WASM modules folks to try to work out if we can do something better for WASM. Um, at the very least, in, in, I, so I discussed, had a discussion with Francis who worked on the CSP specification for WebAssembly modules. And he was open to the idea of supporting more than just WASM unsafe eval, um, but either allowing when you importing WASM in the ESM integration, the ESM integration being the ability to import like a WebAssembly module, uh, like a JS module, that as distinct from the reflection, which is the, the compiled module. Um, he was open to it checking the, the script source policy because now it would have a handle on it. Um, or I'm sorry, could, could you could you go over? I did not follow that. Okay. Uh, so as I showed at the beginning, if you try and import um, a, a JS module from another domain in this example, uh, because it doesn't fulfill the script source policy, it's going to throw a, a CSP error because I'm trying to load a script from another domain. And if I wanted to pass, I'd have to explicitly say unpackage.com is allowed to execute uh, code on this page, and then it would be allowed. Um, so the CSP policy can control what URLs are able to be executed uh, on the page. Uh, for for, JavaScript. For, for, and that's for scripts, not for modules. No, same. This is happening for the module right now. Yeah, so for, for modules, it'll do it. Script source okay. controls both module and uh, script. Uh, yeah, that's the confusion, but yeah. So yeah, script source also means module in this context. Okay. It's more like that being the script. Okay. Got it. So WebAssembly could potentially participate in the same thing, where if you're loading react.wasm, it could basically participate in the same policy here. Yeah. Uh, so 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 let, let, let me let me try to to um, understand the relationship here. Uh, right now, um, the JavaScript, in the absence of a explicit module loading system, uh, we don't have reified source module objects. So you we can't state that the behavior, the CSP behavior we're seeing, is. Uh, only consistent with one theory that you could um, attribute to it either that the throttling is happening going from source to static module record or go, or instantiating the static, static module record. Either of those theories would be consistent with the current CSP JavaScript behavior. Is that correct? Right, because today we don't have a, a this we haven't exposed this phase for JavaScript, which represents compilation without execution. Right, and right. so the check is all just one check right now. Right, uh, uh, and the and and the uh, and in particular, there's with the absence of a, something like a reified module, there's nothing to pass to. Um, another frame such that the question would arise. Right. So, the real, so the constraining factor is that the question already does arise with WebAssembly. Is the current WebAssembly CSP behavior already entrenched such that anything going forward has to preserve the current WebAssembly CSP behavior? So it's actually... Uh not fully finalized uh, the WebAssembly CSP behavior because uh, uh, so we this we've got two new kind of things that will be happening for WebAssembly from this perspective. The one is the direct ESM integration. So that's when you can directly import WebAssembly, which uh, right now 
WebAssembly doesn't participate in script source. It only supports WASM unsafe eval. So in theory, there is no reason WebAssembly couldn't also participate in something like script source when it's imported because you have this tie like JavaScript does where you've got a special function that gives you the module. Right now, WebAssembly is loaded with fetch and there's nothing special about fetch that we know that it's a, a WebAssembly capability. And so it's there's no guardrails. Um, but when we integrate WebAssembly into the JS module system, we're creating a privileged API that allows you to get access to WASM and that API can handle guard, guarding what you have access to. Okay. So, For, so, so, so let me, let me just sort of pursue this line of inquiry. The, um, let's, from the JavaScript side, I think the, the, you know, a big discovery for me last, um, something I, I learned from the last session of this is I was thinking that putting the, the throttling on going from source text to a uh, source module was the better place to put the throttling. And, and uh, what I learned the last time is that from the JavaScript and module loader perspective, uh, probably that's not the best place to put the throttling, rather it's on instantiation. Uh, however, that's not what the web does right now for CSP applied to WASM. Uh, is the, the WASM situation fluid enough that we could instead make the throttling on WASM only on instantiation. Because I don't, I don't, I would prefer that there's only one knob and it only throttles one of those two phases. Uh, so why why is it not preferable uh, to basically have the knob on uh, the first stage where I, I mean. I, I think we should decide by what, how we want the platform to be, uh, what kind of use cases we might see in the platform and, and whether that informs the, the first, uh, a knob on the first uh, stage or on the second stage. I, yes, yes, I, th I think it should be, it should be driven by what we want to, to what we want to, to do with these knobs. Um, I'm not sure I can, I remember it was an aha moment, but I don't know that I can recount the aha accurately. Can anybody else here recount the argument why from a JavaScript module perspective, uh, ex explicit module perspective, that instantiation was the better thing to throttle, to throttle? So that, I think that was this, this transfer problem, which was that if you're transferring the module into another environment, that has a different policy, um, you'd want to check it again at the instantiation time. So right now with this example with the WebAssembly, I was able to run potentially WebAssembly I wasn't allowed to. But the, the way I see it is if you have code that receives that module and explicitly goes in and uh, instantiates it, code that is also able to verify where uh, that message is coming from. Uh, because there is on post message, there is an origin uh, check that you can have. Like that, that code is able to do its own checks and then decide to, uh, to instantiate so it. The, the post message check is, you know, which origins are allowed to communicate, but that's potentially a distinct question from Right. Which origin did the code come from? Yeah. But, but at that point, you have code that you have trusted to execute. And I, I, like, I guess the question is whether you trust that code to, uh, to handle and potentially instantiate something uh, that it has received. I... I... I I, I would like, I know this is powerful, but I, I, I it, it, it would make me sad to try to nerf that. <laughs> um. I mean, one way to, to, to think, I mean, one, one way 
well, Gedanken experiment for thinking about the, this issue is imagining, imagine um, we had two knobs, one for, one, one for suppressing at each phase, um, uh, but it was the same pair for both WebAssembly and JavaScript. Um, the, um, when, would, when would you use, you know, when should you, you clearly use one knob rather than the other? Um, uh, is, 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 does, does either knob dominate the other in the sense that there's a use case, there's a compelling use case for using one of the knobs that using the other knob would not substitute for. Um, uh, if that's the case only in one direction, then one of the knobs dominates. Uh, I don't, I'm not deriving an answer from that. I'm just saying that may, might be a way to investigate. Yeah, and my hope as well is that in presenting this question to the WebAssembly folks, we can figure out if WebAssembly would want to move to an instantiation uh, policy um, or not, because that might also affect you know what JavaScript decides to do. So I, I can continue following this question up from a WebAssembly perspective. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, finding out if it's a possibility for them to uh, move to instantiation, uh, that would say that it's a possibility on our side to use, to have just an instantiation knob for both if we decide that's what we want to do. Uh, but with, without actual, but, but, you know, so investigate that without implying that we know which choice we want to make, but just we want to know what the options are. In, in my opinion, there actually is a good reason to have both knobs. Because the, the non safe eval kind of knob is saying, I don't care where this source came from. Uh, this is just going to be there's a way for me to say I don't I don't care what the source is I just don't want any eval in my page and sure. that's somewhat different because that also includes constructed strings that don't really have a source other than self and the, the problem uh, is uh, as soon as you enable like how like how would you define the evaluation the um, instantiation uh, knob uh, would it be overloaded? Would it be the same script source? I, I don't think it should be because then you get into those cases where it becomes roughly impossible uh, to, to get the case of, oh, I, I have a trusted uh, source here. Uh, I'm passing it around, like go in and uh, you should be able to execute it. If, if you trust me giving you give it me providing it to you so you're saying basically we either need brand checks of some kind on the sources if we're going to do instantiation time checks yeah then you would need two kind of uh csv um another argument for, for uh only source uh at source time is basically that's that's the logical uh or that's like the uh, it, it's very similar to trusted types. Uh, with trusted types right now, you can basically mark some kind of uh, source tech as being trusted and then pass it around your program, not in another realm, but passing it into your, uh, around your, uh, in your current realm, actually more like, yeah, I think current realm. Uh, and then one, and then evaluate it in another place, um, regardless of the, the script source. Uh, do, do, bra do, do browsers currently um, implement, does the eval function uh, currently yeah. recognize trusted type arguments? For trusted type supporting browsers, which are uh, V8 based, yes. So it's V8 only right now? Yeah, I don't think any other browsers have uh, implemented trusted types. Okay. Are, trusted, are trusted types transferable to workers? Um, no. no. No, no, but it's more of the concept, like some piece of your system that you trust fetches uh, and or mints some sort that, that is evaluatable 
uh, and then it goes into a sink that might be in a piece of code that is uh, less trusted. But because that particular string, that particular string carries the the trust around. Let me, let me make let me make sure I understand. The last I looked at trusted types was while all, everything was in draft and everything was still settling. So, um, but what I remember from those days is that the thing that was branded was not the string. It was a, um, a, a, a object containing the string. So yeah, it was an object. object it, it is an object containing the string. Yes, I, I simplified okay. it. Uh, it's an object containing the string, the string and then all the evaluators, all the things are able to recognize those objects instead of uh, taking strings. Okay. Yeah, I, I think this this kind of gets back to maybe the insight that you had, Mark, which is if we want, as far as I remember, I remember if we want to make the module source record, whatever we call that, the, com the compiled module source. Mm -hmm. Yep. If we want to make that somehow privileged, then we need to abandon the third party module source kind of things where we had other things being able to stand in for module sources that weren't necessarily created by this something that would pass a brand check. No, you Does just sound familiar. You just need a mechanism to uh, to brand the virtual module mod uh, to brand the virtual module source. Yeah, and if we have that, then we have a way to be able to implement the instantiation check in a consistent way. Yeah, one of the things that's uh, that um, is that there's nothing in is there anything in the JavaScript standard that is there in order to support trusted types? I know that there was Mike Samuels proposing for a while that eval be able to accept an object rather than a string, uh, and then uh, call to a host hook to um, make a determination about the object. Uh, does anybody know if that happened? I know it's implemented. I don't know how it's specified. <laughs> I believe yeah. there are some Act 262 notes around that supporting other things. And also dynamic import, I believe, was amended to allow taking non-strings so that it could okay. be an instrument in the host. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I understand it's it's more powerful and thus more dangerous, but I, I think it would be nice to keep the ability to uh, to grab and carry the uh, the CSP when you when you fetch, and and then like wherever it's evaluated, even if you post message it to another frame, uh, it ends up being evaluatable. Yeah, yeah. So the question we have right now for this WebAssembly case is like, is this actually a violation that I'm able to transfer this WebAssembly module and run it on a frame that's strictly not allowed to um, evaluate WebAssembly according to its CSP policy? Um, and if we are going to have more fine-grained policies or other types of um, transfer, in, in this case, there's kind of a clear kind of authority hierarchy and that the frame should have lower authority and and if the parents passing in something to the frame maybe that's not a security violation because it's you're going from a higher a place of higher security to lower security but maybe there will be scenarios in future where that isn't the case it will yeah. on. i think i think I, I, every um alarm bells go off in my head every time i hear people talk about high and low yeah, uh, the right, the 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 better framing um, to approach security issues in general, not always, but in general, is mutual suspicion. Neither side is higher than the other. Um, both sides might, either side might attack the other. Both sides would like to protect themselves from the other. I I have implemented systems where uh, the iframe is the high security uh, uh, context. Uh, and it doesn't trust actually the the host the, the parent. Yeah, cer certainly any uh, set of mechanisms that work well for mutual suspicion uh, will also work well um, 
uh, when one is higher than the, when one is strictly higher than the so, other. I mean, by, by that framing, then this is a security vulnerability space because you're allowing a violation of a security policy where an unknown message can potentially be passing this capability without you realizing it um, and without you wanting to support it. And, and, and I argue it isn't really. Uh, it's only if you're, it's only if the code that is uh, already trusted to, the code to handle the incoming messages that has been uh, trusted to execute already does something uh, to, to actually evaluate the, uh, the incoming uh, message. Uh, well, in this case, yes, it has to call WebAssembly.instantiate, but uh, the 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 like from getting from message.data to the WebAssembly.instantiate sync. Uh, yeah, you'd still need to do that, which is quite difficult to do. Um, yeah, but... it's that or you have to dynamic import it uh, or uh, or anything like that. It, it's a pattern that you can definitely audit in the code. Right. Uh, so the, the question is just if it could get, like, say you have some existing module bindings, if they, if they were being dynamically accessed, could they be conflated with a message that you got or something? But probably not. But if if we are considering more complex kind of module transfer scenarios, both for JavaScript and for WebAssembly, um, I guess the question is, do we want to have the ability for these different um, these different realms to have their own policies. Well, I mean, at that point, I think it, that's if I think that's when uh, that that's when we should consider a second uh, an, an extra uh, CSP value, where it's like restrict evaluation, which by default would be uh, limited to the the same set of script source, but then. Like if you okay. specify it, uh, you uh, you end up uh, you end up like restricting the the second knob basically. So so uh, so okay. So this goes. So you're you're engaged in the, basically the Yudankin experiment of imagining that we have both knobs, and then I still you know I, I, and it seems like uh, you're you're making a convincing argument that the instantiation knob. Uh, is not subsumed by the comp let's call it the instantiation knob versus the compilation knob. I think those are those are clear enough terms. Um, that the compilation, I think you're making a case that the compilation knob does not subsume the need for the instantiation knob. It um, may not. It's possible we could have cases where, uh, yes, if you receive. A, a module or something uh, evaluatable um, through post message that you might want to you might want to make sure you never end up ever evaluating those unless they're from a trusted uh, origin. Okay, so uh, that so 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 that so just to the implication of what you just said uh, is that the compilation knob does not subsume the instantiation. The need for the instantiation uh, that we would still, even if we have the compilation knob, we would still want an instantiation knob. Is that correct? Is it correct I'm that that's an impl possible. implication of the argument you just made? I'm saying it's possible some use cases would would like to have that knob. Yes. Okay. What about the other direction? Uh, if we had the instantiation knob, uh, could th would that subsume the need for the compilation? Mm. There, there is one thing about that from a CSP perspective, and that is that um, in the CSP model, it does set request headers at the time that the request is made. Um, and I'm not exactly sure why, but there's this sec fetch dest header for CSP policy that is set when you're making a request under CSP. So they're, they're in, in the actual HTML pipeline, there are actually request time 
algorithms that are associated with the CSP pipeline um, by by the design of CSP. And that's something maybe if we if we had Anne back to have some discussions around, we could potentially dig into further. Um, yeah, this is this is completely unfamiliar territory for me. It, and that that uh that informs the origin that made the request. I, th I don't know if it's purely for some kind of logging. I would be speculating, um, but it is. It, if you want to research it, it's the SEC hyphen. I'll, I'll write it. It's the, um, what, what is the content of that header? That's what I'm, uh, I'm asking. So it's the sec fetch dest header, and it's on um, the, these um, uh, requests. And it also associates with the destination um, of the. Um, of the resource, which determines which policy is being applied. Um, again, this is also unfamiliar territory to me. I, I would need to dive into that some more, but just to all of that to say that I believe the way that CSP is specified links very heavily into the into the request model of the web in the first place. So, so moving it outside of a compile guard because compilation and request are are so close, it, it's it's more of a request check than a compilation check, even if that makes sense. Um, okay, so the it's the content of the sec fetch desk seem to be um, whatever whatever triggered the the the, the request. Yeah. Um, and uh, in cases it would be scripts or I don't know what it would be for an import. That's interesting. But uh, it, it's how the it's how it's fetched. So uh, it's what triggered the fetch. It has nothing to do on how it will be evaluated or that's true. yeah. Does a, a compiled module, a WASM module, uh, have a currently have any unforgeable association with the origin the source was fetched from? It does not currently. And that's something that we want to figure out for import reflection, of course, because if we're exposing this, this um, way to get a module and import reflection, uh, we might want to have both checks um, or or have some kind of metadata that that gets added. And that's the discussion that I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> so um, I'm talking with a bunch of people about it. Yeah. yeah. So let, let me just in, uh, state state another uh, invariant that I think any solution to this should obey, which is um, outside of the web, um, the uh, we want this to be able to, you know, if we're going to have a bunch of mechanism that's part of the JavaScript standard to support this, uh, and we believe that it actually is good for security, it's not just good for web security, um, then uh, it needs to also be good without being tied to notions of origin and same origin policy, uh, that it can be used outside the web uh, for non-origin oriented security, such as object capability security. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and, and I don't know, I don't, I don't have, um, concrete ideas yet about what that implies, but I just want to say that will be a filter that I'm taking to this. Um, yeah. So, uh, sorry, I'll let you finish. No, that was it. Yeah, the um, Dino are co-champions of the import reflection and they do have an interest in a security story for Dino being a non-web platform where they want to use this as a mechanism to be able to um, allow or deny access to WASM modules through the import system. 
and they would want to integrate their own checks where it's sort of defined at, at deployment time and then they can control it during the runtime um, which WebAssembly modules you have access to through an out-of-band out control mechanism which would integrate into the way that they support um, uh, import reflection and and that's you know very much something that we've seen as a feature of, of this way of getting hold of a WASM module because we we're turning the the the, the function that gets the web the WebAssembly dot module object we're turning it into a, a fully host controlled function and that allows it to be able to be a um, a, a capability acquisition um, API yeah. basically. And 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 if I recall, is there anybody from Dino on this call right now? Uh, Luca isn't here today. Uh, he was last time, I think. Okay. Um, if I recall correctly, uh, Dino, even if it's kind of a mixed system, that it's it's um, it's trying to be more you know uh, more based on capability access control theory than identity access control theory. There's a sort of pro capability bias there, which which, if true, means that their investigation of what they'd like for security is more likely to be well aligned with what we would want from a hardened JavaScript and Indo perspective. Uh, potentially, I, I don't know the full details of Dino's security mod mod model. You'd have to ask Luca. Um, but uh, certainly, I, I, I do think that's that the ideas have similar footing. Um, Okay, good. So is in terms of follow-up, I, I can certainly follow up on these questions and in particular that question around, you know, which of these knobs we need to have and if we can have both and, and from a web, from a purely WebAssembly perspective. Uh, and hopefully that can inform what we do uh, for JavaScript in turn um, and at least I think in terms of the progression of the import reflection proposal, the question there is how much do we have to have these concepts figured out to be able to progress with that proposal? And how what stage much, what stage is that proposal at right now? It's at stage two currently, but we are looking to move towards stage three. Okay. So so, uh, so yeah, it's um yeah, stage three things have to be pretty well worked out concretely. So one thing that comes to mind is that I, I believe one of the use cases for model source is being able to uh, understand what the import export bindings of a mod, uh, of some source uh, module source is, but not automatically uh, wanting to be able to evaluate that module source in the current uh, in in the current realm or agent or whatever the boundary is. Um, if we if the knob ends up on this on, on the creation of the module source object basically uh then we might lose the ability to uh to do that analysis of, uh, of binding by creating a module source from some text i guess it also depends on how it's exposed so you know if you're um uh if you have arbitrary um actually no sorry yeah you're right <laughs> yeah but i think charity had an alternative where uh being able to parse uh and, and extract the binding of uh, some uh some source was different than the module source itself right um i th i i don't, I don't know uh I, as far as i'm aware we've been talking about a, a, a singular source in a singular instance, but uh, yeah, I would have to ask Karen. Yeah. I think part of the, the insight from last time that I'm failing to recount uh, in its fullness, uh, but I think part of it was the the layering of concepts in the overall 
module um, epic that there's uh, before you get to compart the, you know the one of the, before you get to the compartment layer the prior layer is evaluators and for the for the evaluators layer uh, that's the layer where uh, parameterized by an import hook you create um, uh, an eval function a you know function constructor uh, and a, um, um, a if I recall correctly a module instantiator uh, because it's only on instant yeah that's right because because you don't need an eval an eval hook isn't relevant for com for uh, compiling to a source module, uh, but it's required, of course, to go from a source module to an instantiated module. Uh, so, um, so the so at least API design. That's not an argument from use cases. It's an argument from uh, the sort of what's most parsimonious from the API um, structure that we've been um, proposing that see where the, that API structure was arrived at to satisfy multiple other constraints. I, uh, I actually take that back, back what I was saying, like you can build a module source, you can uh, import it eventually. Uh, it's just captures, oh no, you can't, right. <sighs> Because you said like we we say module source is the only thing that is structured clonable, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it does point to it does point to having the uh, check being done at the evaluation phase. There is another alternative there. Wait, wait, wait. Sorry, evaluation phase is is. The, uh, the uh, compilation, uh, uh, sorry, uh, we said two nodes were either compilation or uh, the other Insta one. Instantiation. So at the instantiation phase, uh, it, okay. it does not being uh, affected at the uh, instantiation phase. Okay. There, there is another option there, and that's to actually have a, um, a guard at the transfer phase. So do you have permission? to receive this module and and have some kind of checks at the at that so you you got the, the the so i think maybe from an equivalence perspective it's it's you have to guard all your sources or you have to guard all your sinks um and maybe those are equal in in power those techniques oh, so you mean csp would apply to uh to the payload uh, that's being transferred Right. So when you transfer from one context to another uh, in, in a structured clone, um, that you um, would somehow have that check taking place on the transfer boundary, that it's able to be transferred. Okay. So, let, let, so let's remember that as a, a possible third knob. Uh, and it, it is the case that that you know, all three of these knobs are coherent from a capability perspective. Sometimes you, in a capability system, sometimes you enforce policy by what you have the capability to do. And so, sometimes you enforce policy uh, by the boundary mechanism that uh, things have to pass through. Well, my main concern is that CSP intrinsically is an ACL uh, and and I mean, it, it is it is a list of identity origins that are allowed that are treated differently, uh, and so it it does conflict with the notion that passing some object around would try to do something because now we're basically trying to apply we're we're basically trying to apply uh, an ACL onto uh, onto a possible uh, capability carrying object. I mean the web. It's. I mean, whatever we we put into the JavaScript standard uh, would not directly call out origins or ACLs or CSP. Uh, it would be something where outside the web, um, uh, that whatever mechanism 
we're talking about at the JavaScript level should be usable in a net you know, to support capability oriented policies. Now, I don't I don't know that that you know what I don't know what the implications are about what these knobs look like when you take that filter to them. Um, but the fact that the web would use it in an ACL oriented way does not by itself disqualify. So yeah, for for the import reflection proposal, the the integration question for us is how do we integrate the JS module system with whatever policies are happening? Um, and that's maybe an easier question to figure out than how do JavaScript source um, module source objects want to integrate into these kind of security policies, which is the wider question. That's probably the, the next question to tackle once we figured out what we're doing for WebAssembly, maybe. Just just want to say we're at time. Um, yeah, we're... Oh. I don't know if we want to spend a bit of time cleaning up before we exit this meeting or, oh, ZB says it's okay to go over and he's the main participant in this meeting, so. Um, I think we should summarize uh, at this point, unless anyone has anything else to add to the topic. Um, from what I heard is that no matter what, uh, WASM and JS module should be consistent with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, whether the knobs are instantiation, uh, or compilation phase or instantiation phase, uh, it should be the same for JS and for WASM. Um, we may have the precedence that currently a uh, WASM module, the checks seem to be done at the compilation phase uh, and given that you would be able to reflect the, the source and still instantiate it with the uh, existing APIs, uh, I don't think there would be a way to have something that was fetched and passed the unsafe eval, uh, unsafe was a eval, uh, or something that was import sourced have and, and, and end up having a different behavior. Uh, I think those two things should end up being the same thing. So. We may be constrained there into uh, uh I so the, the, the question right. is you know uh, because we potentially can have different behavior for them because fetch doesn't have any um kind of in, integration with what it is fetching um whereas uh so so that's the problem with fetching WebAssembly today is that you don't know that you're fetching WebAssembly, you're just fetching arbitrary bytes Whereas right. okay. by integrating it into the module system, at the moment that WebAssembly gets integrated into the module system, we have that strong link between the fetch and the compile that allows us to provide st stronger security policies or, or potentially branding um, at that level. So it's possible that something that was import source, uh, if you get a module, if you get a WASM module source, through import source, or if you get it by a compile from fetch, uh, those could end up, uh, one, uh, in the second case, you uh, we could say like, oh, you never end up having a uh, instantiation, uh, going through an instantiation knob, but in the first case, you do have an instantiation knob uh, taking effect, I see. Yeah, let me, let me also just express a preference, uh, you know, a soft preference, that at the end of the day, we end up with only one knob out of the three that we've discussed. Yeah, and, and I think in principle, I would like to have somehow a, I would like to, I would love to have a way to transfer uh, a module knowing that uh, the receiver will just be able to uh, inst uh, instantiate it. Um, but maybe that's just not compatible uh, with the web platform model. It, it's an option to say that these cross realm policies don't get enforced and that when you have these linked realms, they all just end up at the highest execution policy. And, and that's sort of what WebAssembly is doing today. So yeah, that, that's maybe something we can pick up again next time. 
Um, it'll be interesting to dig into. And it sounds like the CSP authors and or the integration with Wasm, like they need to get back to us, uh, see which, if the current behavior is intended and if they've, uh, or if they believe that that fits the web platform correctly or wasn't. Sure. Yeah, po point of order. Um, yeah. uh, I think it's this Zoom channel that's reused by the endo meeting. Uh, have people arrived here for the end of meeting? Yes, we need to. Uh, 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 yes, and they're enjoying. Don't worry. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think that's it. Um, all right, thanks everyone. Thank you.